Wolverhampton Wanderers has circled the football globe and they've become one of the greatest clubs in the history of the game. But little could the enthusiasts of St Luke's school have imagined when they formed Blakenall St Luke's in 1876 and lost their first match to Stafford Road FC 8-0 in January 1877, what great feats lay ahead. They played their first games on a pitch off Goldthorn Hill that has long since been given over to housing. Moving to a ground known as John Harper's Field opposite the Niffon Works near St Luke's in 1879. They began to establish themselves as a strong team, and in 1880 they joined forces with Blakenall Wanderers Cricket Club to form Wolverhampton Wanderers, and soon after moved to an improved ground opposite the Fighting Cox Pub in Dudley Road. Their growing reputation was well founded, and season 1881-82 saw them play 18 matches, winning 10 and losing only 4. They remained at their new ground for four years, using the King's Arms that still stands in Dudley Road as their headquarters, with occasional matches using the nearby Blakenall cricket pitch, now covered by a supermarket. In 1883 they entered the FA Cup for the first time, and won their first ever trophy, the Rekin Cup. Walls were firmly established as one of the leading clubs in the land, and were invited to become one of the founder members of the Football League in 1888. Their first league game ended in a one-all draw with Aston Villa, and Wolves finished the season a creditable third in the table. They also reached the final of the FA Cup, losing 3-0 to Preston North End at Kennington Oval. The search had already begun to find a new ground to match the Wolves' status, and the club's itinerant years were over when they eventually moved to a brand new home, converted from the grounds of Molyneux House. The new stadium was open with a friendly against Aston Villa, which Wolves, playing in their customary faded red and white stripes, won 1-0. The now famous gold and black colours didn't appear until 1891 and were sported by Wolves in their first FA Cup final success in 1893, when they beat Everton 1-0 with a Harry Allen goal at Fallowfield in Manchester. The ball used and a replica of the trophy still stand in Wolves' trophy cabinet. That FA Cup victory was so important to the town that the players, many of them local lads, became heroes and Wanderers Avenue just off Dudley Road, which was renamed after the Cup victory, still has many houses bearing the names of that legendary side. In April 1896, Wolves again reached the cup final, this time played at the Crystal Palace. They went 1-0 down to Sheffield Wednesday and despite an equaliser from David Black, eventually lost 2-1. Following 20 years of improvement, Wolves' league fortunes began to plateau and even decline. In 1905 they slipped into the second division, where they remained for 13 seasons. Despite this, they again won the FA Cup in 1908, beating 1st Division Newcastle United 3-1 at the Crystal Palace, with Reverend Kenneth Hunt getting Wolves first, and George Headley and Billy Harrison also scoring. Wolves had to wait a further 13 years to reach the Cup final again. This time they faced Spurs at Stamford Bridge on St George's Day, in front of nearly 73,000 spectators. Despite their poor league form, Wolves were confident of success but the only goal of the game came from the Londoner's outside left, Jimmy Dimmock. Wolves' league form failed to show any improvement and in 1923 they were relegated to Division 3 North. That humiliation spurred them on and promotion followed in the next season. Albert Legg was part of that promotion winning side, who were all presented with commemorative watches by their appreciative supporters. We was losing, losing three down at half time playing him and beat them. And we went in, they then half gave us a win and I think it was the major. I, you, we come out, come out second half, we managed to win four three. <laughs> but I was a junior professional. But I was, I was on, in 1921, I was only cleaning the, the dressing room out and the bath and the players' boats. And uh, you know, I'm just touching the band, but I was a junior professional, I got four pound a week. You could only get four pound a week. Uh, Two hundred and eight pound a year, and I had ten pounds for signing. And the in the first division, 
They could only get eight and six. They couldn't get no more. And the two pound bonus, and no one a pound for a draw. Couldn't get. They couldn't get no no, no more. Or no, I got. Well, I got. I got four pound a week, two hundred and eight pound a year. And I went to my mother's in New Cross when I signed for the Wolves to show me agreement. And I was come walking up the road, up the Bushby Road, and there was, I know two old fellas coming, was limp across the road from the pub, the squiddle, a banked house. And uh, my bloke named Mr. Santa and uh, Mr. Tarbuck. And they said, oh, are you going on? I said, oh, all right. I said, oh, no, I play, you know. I said, I just signed for the Wolves, because I played for the Lewisham Athletic, the pub, you know, the Lewisham. And they used to come every Sunday morning and see us play. Oh, and he said, do you come and have a drink? I said, oh, no, I said, drink. I did. Oh, well, I don't, don't drink. I was sour 30. Oh, smoke. And he said, you can have a shandy. I said, oh, I'll go in then. I went in with him and I said, shandy. I showed him the agreement. And there were stools in the squiddle then. They nearly fell off the bloody stool. There was the bloody head blacksmith at the Colwell. The bloke was forming up in the machine shop. That was only getting two pounds sixteen. With the brilliant Tom Phillipson leading the forward line, Wolves established themselves in the higher division. But it was to take them eight seasons to return to their former status as a Division One side. That feat was engineered by one of Wolves' greatest ever managers, Major Frank Buckley, who took over in 1927. Wolves won the second division championship in 1932, scoring 115 goals. In 1934, Buckley brought to Molyneux the man who was to become a Wolves stalwart, both as a player and a manager, Stan Cullis. A new team was being moulded together by disciplinarian Buckley, and as they matured they took Wolves to their highest ever league finish, ending second in the first division in 1938. The following season was to be even more successful. Runners up in the league once more, they reached the FA Cup final. The Second World War suspended league football for eight years. Wolves forward Dennis Westcott scored three goals in a two-legged walk-up final against Sunderland in 1942 to win the trophy. But perhaps the most significant thing for Wolves in that period was that a young man by the name of Billy Wright signed professional forms in 1941. Billy made his league debut for Wolves immediately after the war with the team guided by new manager Ted Vizard. Wolves finished third in the league that season and Stan Cullis retired as a player. Billy Wright took over as captain and when Vizard resigned in the summer of 1948, Cullis became the new boss. This was the start of a Wolves golden era that included three championships and two FA Cup victories. Dan Cullis uh, got some maps and he got plans how to score goals. And if you got from your goal area to their goal area in less than four passes, you'd have more chance of scoring a goal by hustling and bustling and get there. If you got eight to ten passes, you wouldn't get you know, goals as often. And that's how we wanted to play. And of course it suited us because we had the two wingers and then in the champions from like Hancock's and Mullen. They, they were unusual, Gerald, in as much the ball could come over from either wing, whether it was to Mullen or to Hancock, and they hit the ball on the volley. They didn't stop it, they hit it. Now, that was very unusual. I mean, in the great uh, Matthews and Finney, they couldn't do that, but Hancock's and Mullen could, and that's how we used to get a lot of goals. You go past the far post, and the ball would be in the back of the net before you could say Jack Robinson. That was, I think, one of our great assets, plus a goal of being fit. Major liked the players to be fit and standard. I mean, we play, uh, train very, very hard, running. We'd open up, you know, say Tuesday morning, running by, uh, running about three miles. Then you go down to a mile, then 800, then 200, and then the sprints. With the superb Peter Broadbent in midfield and right in control at the back, supplying the ball to their flying wingers, Wolves produced a never-to-be-forgotten season and took the Division I Championship in 1954. But the 1953-54 Championship, you know, we was just a good team and we were just beginning to get very good. And that's how it really started, because we played very well, you know, in the first division. And uh, 
We had a good team, a lot of good players. Well, I think the Envy game was the, one of the best that I remember about. Uh, considering we uh, did actually win 3-2 and they were leading 2-9 uh, within no time you know, of the match. But it's, it was just the crowd of Wolverhampton and everything that made it for us and we actually won 3-2 in the end. I mean, there were some famous names in the Odenvid team, but of course there was few famous names in the Wolves team and we've actually played well and deserved it. Cullis's side continued to develop. Imposing Scott Malcolm Finlayson took over in goal from England keeper Bert Williams. Hard man Eddie Clamp was threatening in defence, while the distinctive Ron Flowers established himself as an England regular. Bill Slater, the last of the semi-pros, eventually took over as skipper when Billy Wright retired in 1959. And with Norman Dealey on the wing and the cultured Broadbent supplying the fertile scoring talents of Jimmy Murray, Wolves raced to consecutive championships in 58 and 59. We didn't think we were ever going to get beaten. And that was a sort of uh, a relationship amongst the players that we knew. You know, we just thought that we were going to win today. It's going to be... We knew it before we went out. Yeah, well, it was lovely to sort of <laughs> play in a team like that where everybody knew what they were doing and why they were there. You know, and uh, it was great. The atmosphere in the changing rooms and everything was marvellous. This was a truly remarkable era for Wolves. They never finished out of the top six in the first division for nine years, and for four consecutive seasons, they scored over a hundred goals. Good evening, welcome to Sports Fuel. This evening, we've sent a mobile unit to Wolverhampton Wanderers, the Football League champions. And to find out what's happening at Wolverhampton tonight, we can see their training. David Coleman, please come in. Well, now, what makes the Wolves such a remarkably successful club? What goes on behind the scenes? Their success prompted the BBC to focus on their methods. Wolves were renowned at the time for advanced training techniques and for first-class physiotherapy. Their forward thinking on the pitch was matched off it. A young David Coleman was shown the club's plans for a spectacular new stadium in 1959. But it was a dream that would not become a reality for another 34 years. Well now, thank you very much for allowing us to come along, Mr Baker. You're England's representative in the, in the European Cup this year. The best of luck. And I wonder if that championship shield there will find a resting place here at the end of next season. That victory emphasised Wolves' success at every level. They'd won every trophy that their teams had entered in the 1958-59 season, except for the FA Cup. But that omission was corrected a year later, when they faced Blackburn at Wembley. I remember it was a very, very hot day. And it was, you know, I mean, there was a, it was so hot that, you know, within half an hour playing, you know, it was just, you couldn't get your breath or anything like that. But I can remember that uh, we played very well and, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to enjoy something at Wembley and also to win the cup final. You know, and there was a, I forget who it was, lying second in the league that year. And they, I mean, it was Manchester United or Burnley beat so and so and so and so and left us one point behind. A poor start to the 1964-65 season, which saw Wolves collect only one point from their first seven games, meant Stan Cullis was sacked after 30 years' service at Molyneux by new chairman John Ireland. Their names ironically now appell adjacent stands at Molyneux. New boss Andy Beatty took over and Wolves set off on an FA Cup run that saw them beat Aston Villa in a second replay at the Hawthorns and then face Manchester United in the sixth round, unfortunately losing a thrilling match 5-3. But league form was still disappointing. Astonishingly for a team that had dominated the previous decade, Wolves were relegated that season to Division 2. Former West Bromwich Albion hero Ronnie Allen took over as manager and guided Wolves to promotion in 1967 with a side containing new heroes like Bailey, Wagstaff, Dugan, 
and the talented Peter Knowles, whose decision to quit football for religious reasons at the age of only 24 shocked the Wolverhampton public. Obviously, you were a very talented player who could have had so much. Well, I probably do, you know, but uh, you see, I feel there's more to life than money, you see, and fame. I get a lot of happiness now with being a Jehovah's Witness. I'm content, I'm happy, and um, football couldn't offer me that. With Bill McGarry now installed as manager, a new era began at Molyneux, with Wolves missing out on third place in the first division only by goal difference in 1971. At the beginning of the 70s we had a lot of experienced quality players, people like Bailey, Monroe, Parkin, Dugan, uh, Wagstaff, and they were the sort of basis of the team. Then we had younger players coming in within a, within a short space of, say, a couple of years, people like myself, Kenny Hibbert, uh, John McCall, which, which created a very strong team with a, with a good blend of youth and experience and all quality players. Disappointing the, the UEFA Cup because we'd done a lot against the best in Europe, beating Juventus, beating Ferenc Varus, and I don't really think we got the credit for those successes because pe teams like Juventus, they were at the time probably the top team in Europe, but it was um, the fact that we we knocked them out in the quarter-final and ended up meeting a, an English team in the final itself. It, it tended to take the edge off that particular competition that year and I don't think we, we were given the credit uh, for all those good performances. And I think really it was possibly the 71, 72, 73, 74 years when we should have done a lot more. We, as you said, we missed out quite a number of times in one season we finished fifth in the league and lost in both semi-finals and it's hard to sort of point out pinpoint anything to say you know why why that happened I think possibly we we, we could have possibly done with one or two other players just to strengthen the squad because we, we probably had about a dozen 14 good good players and we probably needed two more to sort of slotting when we got injuries or people out of form and I think that would have made the difference I think we would have come away with more than the one trophy which is what we won in 74 Law, uh, Fanny Lee, had a, Rodney Marsh, they had, a, they had a superb squad and we were by far the underdogs and as with uh, a lot of cup finals and I'm pleased to say it was uh, the underdogs came out on top but I think what was pleasing about it was the was the performance I think we it was an excellent match and uh, I felt that we we did deserve it on the day. I think it was everybody coming right at the same time. It was still mixed feelings during the match because I was, I, in the second half I was having problems with with my pelvis. It was, it was giving me a lot of pain and McGarry was going to substitute me. He got Barry Powell warming up and then as these things happened, Dave Wagstaff uh, went on one of his runs down the wing, pulled a muscle and he had to come off. And in those days we only had one substitute. So Barry came on to replace replaced Dave and I stopped on and scored the winner. It was probably the highlight of my career at Wolves because of the fact that um, we'd been missing out in the previous two or three seasons and obviously scoring a winning goal at Wembley. We were unfortunate to go down. It's, it's, a lot of people say that when the teams go down, but we did have a good squad of players, and I think that showed in the fact that we, we bounced straight back by winning the second, the second division championship, as it was then. Bill McGarry was replaced by his assistant, Sammy Chung, and Wolves immediately bounced back. After finishing 15th in Division 1, Wolves' worst start to a season in 1978 cost Chung his job, and he was replaced by John Barnwell. Wolves flirted with the drop, but did manage to reach the FA Cup semi-final, launched an ambitious plan to rebuild Molyneux. The first phase being the replacement of the old Molyneux Street stand with an impressive cantilever structure, built well away from the pitch to allow room on the opposite side to redevelop the cramped Waterloo Road stand. 
Little did Walls know that it would take 14 more years for the rest of the redevelopment to be completed. And the debt incurred in this first phase was to cause almost fatal financial turbulence. Well, it means, it means an awful lot to me, but I, I feel it means a lot more to the club itself because uh, I think over the, the last couple of months we've proved to possibly a doubting public that we're good enough to compete with the best. I mean, you look at uh, the league table and the, the teams that are above us and we've beaten every single one of them and beaten them well. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, the side's going to Wembley and hopefully that uh, we can win it for the Wolverhampton public. Playing uh, consistently well uh, throughout that season and throughout the season previously, we were hit and miss, having some good games, having some bad games. We just happened to have a good run in the League Cup in 1980 and everything fell into, fell into place for us. It was our last success and my last success for, for a number, number of years. Um, but I think you could see the signs of, of the decline that was coming. Worse was to come in 81-82. John Barnwell departed in January, and Ian Greaves arrived from Oxford. But he couldn't arrest the decline, and Wolves were relegated. I first got to know, really, Sir Jack, in, in uh, 1982, when the club was again in receivership, and we did put together a scheme at that time to try and save the club. But unfortunately, we, we were about bid at the, at the death, on the as late as five to five on the Friday, and the Barty brothers and Dugan came together and uh, took over the club. Off the field, the financial situation was critical, and with just five minutes to go before an official receiver's deadline, a deal was completed to save Wolves. At the head of the takeover consortium was former Molyneux hero Derek Dugan, but the money behind him came from elusive businessmen, the Barty brothers. Graham Hawkins was installed as boss, Wolves went on to clinch promotion behind champions Queen's Park Rangers. Wolves started the new season disastrously. Andy Gray was sold to Everton, and it wasn't until November the 26th that they managed their first victory. It's all about confidence, isn't it? But how do you inject confidence into a side that still hasn't had a victory? Well, you can say you can say all the words, you can say all the right words, and you try to be cheerful, or you, in different ways that you do. I, th I think I've tried every way possible. You, you try um, harsh words, you try kind words, and and in the end, it's the players going out there. And I, I still think that first victory, no matter how it comes, whether we play awful and we get and we get that victory, I think that will give a hell of a lift. The writing was already on the wall for Wolves, who were relegated with only eight wins that season. Hawkins left in April 84 with his assistant Jim Barron taking temporary control. The new manager of Wolverhampton Wanderers Football Club. Much travelled Tommy Doherty arrived to take charge of his 13th club, but the new regime's hopes were short-lived, and Chief Executive Dugan departed in January, relegation to Division 3 followed, and out went Doherty. Once again, the club was on the critical list, with only 300 season tickets sold for the new season and staff unsure if they would even get paid. The ground itself was also in critical condition with just two sides open. Bill McGarry returned to the scene of his former success but stayed only 61 days to be replaced by Sammy Chapman. It's bad. That's only curiosity that it would be if you're in any job that mm. things are looking a bit, you know, dodgy. But from the playing point of view, all they're waiting on is the start of the season, pre-season games. They look forward to it. Presumably two weeks tonight, the team will be heading for Griffin Park and the opening game of a new season with Brentford. Although the club had promising players like John Morrissey, John Purdy, and even future England keeper Tim Flowers, the ignominy of being only the second team in the league's history to drop from first to fourth in successive seasons could not be avoided. 
Meanwhile, the High Court was striving to sort out the tangled web of the club's financial situation, as Central News reported. A firm of quantity surveyors and architects were applying to have the company wound up because they claim Allied owed them £127,000 for work they'd done at Molyneux. The case was dismissed, though, because Mr Justice Hoffman ruled there was a genuine doubt over who actually owed the money. Allied, or an international company called Al Akbar Finance. It was claimed that Al Akbar, a Swiss-based company, have assets of £30 million, but no one has been able to chase them. It was claimed by the Barty brothers that Al Akbar are registered in Liberia. If not for that doubt over who owed the money, Mr Justice Hoffman said he would have granted the winding up order since Allied had clearly had difficulty in meeting its debtors. A receiver was appointed, but Wall survived closure once more, and a deal was completed between the local council, Asda Supermarkets, and Birmingham developers Gallagher's. It, it became another liability in uh, in '86 with another uh, receivership, and Sir Jack once again did had an arrangement with ourselves and Tony Gallagher, and. Um, Eventually, when the, the, the club did get on its way, Sir Jack offered to back it. Football could continue at Molyneux, and Brian Little became acting manager. However, the new regime wanted Graham Turner as boss, and he took over in October 1986, and soon made a significant acquisition when he signed Steve Ball from West Bromwich Albion. Uh, he made it clear at the Albion that uh, he wanted me out the, at the way. I wasn't really on. <laughs> I wasn't even on any money at all down the Albion, so I couldn't see why he wanted to get rid of me. But uh, it was a it was a bit of a boost for them. I mean, fifty thousand or sixty five thousand, what it was. Uh, I came here and it was about three minutes. I think I was in with the gaffer and I says, "That's it. That'll do for me. I'll I'll start from start from scratch and start at the bottom, work my way up." Most Wolves fans thought things couldn't get any worse, but on November the twenty fourth, nineteen eighty six, they did. Non-league Chorley humiliated the once proud Wolves 3-0 in an FA Cup first round replay. Chorley's second goal after an hour was scored by Mark Edwards. Then on 71 minutes the decline of a once famous club was compounded when Cooper got his second and Chorley's third. When I first came to the club uh, we played Chorley away 3-0 in, in the cup match and I thought uh, what are we doing here? But uh, as you say, 65,000 in, in them days was a bargain. Like now, now you're talking millions. Uh, when I first got in the club, it was uh, it was all run down. It was all ready for the uh, doldrums for the people to come in and take it over. But then all of a sudden, it just got uh, it took up, and uh, we've, we've got here. We signed one or two players like Bully and, and Andy Thompson and, uh, from West Bromwich, and uh, it all worked out for us in the finish. And. Uh, uh, we, we were unlucky to lose to Aldershot in the playoffs and at, at one period we'd been sixth from bottom in the league. The GM conference looked a likely uh, proposition but uh, having, having got past that we went I think it was about a 19 match run, finished with 70 odd points, 77 points, way ahead of Aldershot but lost in the playoff. But then the following season was a, was a big success because we won the league and the uh, Sherpa van. Wolves arrived at Summerton Park knowing that one point was all they needed to ensure promotion. Not a difficult task, but if nothing else, Newport's remaining pride was at stake. It took Wolves 20 minutes to get their first corner and a further two to take the lead. From Stout's free kick, Holmes nodded the ball into Steve Bull's path for an easy 49th of the season. Three minutes later, the game as a contest was over. Downing's corner was only partially cleared. Bull made himself room to stroke the ball out of Paul Bradshaw's reach. What better way to score his 50th of the season? Almost on half time, and his acrobatics nearly made it three. The second half was a terrible anticlimax, and a mediocre game deteriorated. Wolves were certain of promotion it seemed, but Newport were equally determined to spoil the party and Steve Tupling, their captain, tucked away a good goal. In the final minute, Andy Much made it three. Wolves were promoted. Missing out on promotion in the playoffs in 1987, they made no mistake next season and took the Sherpa Van Trophy for good measure. The Sherpa Van Trophy might not be the most prestigious they've ever won, 
that this season could mark an important watershed in the continued revival of one of the proudest clubs in the Football League. Well, that, that, that gate will probably never... Well, it's got no chance of ever being repeated, I don't think. There's 80-odd thousand there for, for what was a, a fourth division final, really. Walls were now unstoppable, and the third division title followed. This gave them the dubious distinction of being the first club to have won all divisional titles. Wolves took the lead just before half-time when Andy Much laid on a header for Steve Bull. But in the second half, Sheffield hits back with two goals in five minutes, the first from centre-half Stankleys. Then it was Tony Agana who made it 2-1. But a free kick from Robbie Dennison gave Wolves the point they needed for the title. The final score, Wolves 2, Sheffield United 2. The final hurdle was promotion to the top division. But even with new owner Sir Jack Hayward's financial backing, that wasn't going to be easy. Jack actually came in it, I think, later, because Tony, Tony Gallagher was obviously looking to sell the club. And Jonathan got very interested and uh, came along to a lot of the matches when I was pretty well on my own. And he, he, he worked on his dad, I think, and that was the way that the, that the deal was concluded, really. But it was, it was done on a car park in uh, but Plymouth Argyle, so Jack went down to see a water diviner. He was trying to get water onto his, one of his holdings. And uh, he talked to me that he'd had words with, uh, with Tony Gallagher and was prepared to buy the club, and that's, the way, that's where it started, really. Eventually, when the, the, the club did get on its way, so Jack offered to build a new stadium, and that was, the, that was the, really the turning point. It's the greatest thing that's happened to this club, really, no question about that in, in all its history. I mean, when we used to be in this uh, ramshackle stadium, you know, with, with three, so, well, two sides derelict, the North Bank, the cow sheds, I used to call it, and the uh, Waterloo Road stand, which is now the Billy Wright stand, uh, when that was derelict and the terraces were up on one end and only the John Island stand and the field miles away from the John Island stand, I used to think it, it was uh, probably, well, it was like playing in a park, but when we used to go to places like West Ham, Swindon, where the stands are absolutely packed right on the edge of the pitch, I mean, I used to say to Jonathan, this is frightening for a team to be coming out into this, and he used to say, Dad, it, it's worth a goal, it, it's, worth, it's worth one goal. The incredible rebuilding of Molyneux, financed by Sir Jack, was completed in 1993 and marked by a match against Hungarian side Honved. The legendary Ferenc Puskas and Billy Wright, who played in that fantastic floodlit match 39 years earlier, were present to witness the opening of the magnificent new Molyneux. Graham Turner couldn't keep the momentum of his revival going, and in March 1994, he departed to be replaced by former England boss Graham Taylor. Steve Bull, one of the major factors in Wolves' renaissance, continued to pile up his goal tally, getting his 200th league goal at South End, and putting Wolves in the playoffs with his 250th Wolves goal at Tranmere.
Johnson. Settles for the corner. As Thompson's the player, he likes getting forward. He's an attacking minded fullback. He's got plenty of room here. A great stage to go and show himself off and to get quality crosses in. I was a little surprised he set up for the corner there. Despite a fine performance in the first leg of the playoff semi-final at Molyneux, Wolves couldn't overcome Bolton in the second leg. But this had been their highest league placing for 11 years, and their eventual restoration to the top division is surely not far away. It's, it's like a, a dream come true actually, watching it come from uh, the bottom of the fourth division to the first division, hopefully the Premier League next year. Uh, it's just a, it's just unbelievable. I've, I've, I've got loads of like, trophies and things, memorabilia things to, to say what, what I've done at this club and I've enjoyed every minute of it. There is no question that this club will eventually arrive in the, in the Premier League. As to what it will do, I'm, I, I, I can't predict that. I mean, but I, I, I do wish it for Sir Jack and Jonathan that uh, we shall get some success, certainly not, not too far too distant future.